966. This is the 966 episode 60. Richard, we're back better than ever. Took a little bit of time off, a little bit more than we thought. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you? Good to see you, my friend. Great to see you. And it's not like we don't talk all the time anyway, but you know, it's fun to be back at 60 and uh, well, at, at number 60. And it's, uh, it's fun to be back here with you. Indeed. And it's good to see you as well. And we're rejuvenated. We're not really well rested, but either way, we've got a really terrific program this week. So much to discuss since we've been away. No guests this week as we're still finding our footing, getting back into it this week. And it's really because we do have some amazing guests in the pipelines for the coming week. So just want to say hello again to all of you in the 52 countries, Richard, that are listening to this show. Thousands more on YouTube. Soon we'll be putting some of our countries. clips out on social media. Yeah, 52 countries. Isn't that amazing? Um, oh, my golly, yes. So we've, we've got a lot of stuff going behind the scenes here. Um, we're really excited to be back on the air. Um, as always, wherever you're getting this, subscribe to us uh, on YouTube. Uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, 28 platforms now, Richard, uh, that where you can get our podcast. And you can just actually get it too on our website, the 966podcast.com. Um, if you're you know, on the go and you just want to go to that URL, it'll be there. Um, so check it out. Uh, Richard, I think I've grandstanded long enough here. No, and let's I just get to it. Okay. Add to that, that YouTube channel is awesome. And we continue, and Lucian, Lucian's the, the master in all this. And we can you try and make it more useful. My mom the other day said, hey, um, where are all the, I, I just want to know, can I have a list by episode, you know, all 60 episodes now after we finish today? I said, yeah, that's on the YouTube channel. And then I went through and we do have a playlist for that, but it's not populated, fully populated. But all that to say, and it's simply because of bandwidth, there's so much that needs to be done and segments and that sort of thing. And I know you're working your butt off. Um, but all these things are coming. Everything we're doing, we're getting better at. Inshallah, I think we're getting. You know, we're trying to get better at the show. We're trying to get better at at content and presentation. Trying to get better at uh, the social media aspect and all the platforms because um, we're growing. Like you say, fifty two countries, twenty eight you know podcast platforms, just uh, just a slew of of segments on that YouTube channel. Indeed. And we also ask that our listeners get a little bit better, too, um, if we can be respectful in the comments on YouTube and um, wherever you're listening to this. Um, everybody's opinion is welcome. And we love seeing all the feedback, um, getting a ton of compliments there, Richard, which is always really exciting is um, nice. to read. Um, and we definitely respect people who disagree with what we're saying. And we get a lot of that as well. This is a forum. So we uh, very much respect that. We just... Uh, wish that everybody would be respectful to each other. That's all we ask for, um, as we do not have the bandwidth to go clean up those comments. Uh, so um, <laughs> thankfully, YouTube may, I don't know, throttle some of them back. I actually don't know. So anyway, so thank you to you all who are listening to this. Um, Richard, let's get to it, man. What's your one big thing this week? My one big thing It's uh, for this episode is kind of a in case you missed it topic. Um, as we have discussed previously on the 966, this past summer was quite the diplomatic whirlwind for, for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, as we know, U.S. President Joe Biden, Turkey President Recep Erdogan, Egyptian President Sisi, numerous others traveled to Saudi Arabia to meet with him. He, in turn, traveled to Turkey, Egypt, Jordan, and France, high-level meetings. Um, and when you look at it, again, something we've discussed on the 966, combined with the Al Ula Declaration in January 2021, which was sort of a coming together of the GCC, negotiations with Iran, they've had five and they five sort of summits, quote unquote, and and uh, continued communications, growing rapprochement with uh, rapprochement with Iraq, increased coordination between GCC states. These past 18 months have really firmly established MBS as, as a pivotal regional and global foreign policy figure, possibly the pivotal foreign policy figure in the region. Um, and this is the ICYMI moment. And interestingly, there was another country, MBS, actually took the time to make an official visit to this summer, not once, but twice. And that country? Greece. Greece. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I sorry, I stepped on you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> Don't we all wish we could have visited Greece twice a summer, by the way? <laughs> it would be nice. It would be nice. 
Um, yes, Greece. Uh, that of the minuscule $176 million in trade with Saudi Arabia in 2021. That Greece, with the $216 billion GDP, which is about a quarter of Saudi Arabia's and, and, and places Greece 26th out of the 27 EU member economies, Greece, with roughly 10 million people, which places them again 25th out of the 27 EU member states. Yet Mohammed bin Salman visited Greece twice this summer, the second time announcing, quote, this means a lot to Saudi Arabia and, and me, and I promised Greece that I would not return empty-handed. We now have cooperation that will be a turning point for our countries in the entire region. I mean, interesting what's going on here. And some interesting, really interesting things are going on, as it turns out. First, some context. Yes, Greece is at the tail end of EU states in terms of GDP and population, but it is a member, uh, becoming the 10th member of the current 27 members in 1981, which means it is integrated economically and politically into a group that represents about 450 million people, more than $17 trillion in GDP. And with most of those member states having you know, fairly high human development index scores. Second, and this is important, and, uh, and you know, if you don't look at the map, you sort of don't it doesn't really jump out at you. Athens is less than a thousand miles from Neon Bay. Uh, and along with nearby Cyprus, which MBS also visited this summer, it's a natural point of entry to the Southern uh, uh, European Union. Uh, Cyprus, by the way, is 450 miles from, from Neon Bay. Third, Saudi Arabia and Greece have already agreed to invest close to $850 billion dollars to build a subsea, $850 billion, to build a subsea and terrestrial fiber optic data cable project that will link Singapore with Italy and France, passing through Riyadh and Saudi Arabia, and of course, Greece. This, quote, uh, East to Med data corridor will be developed by Saudi Arabia's STC and Greek telecom uh, satellite leader TTSA. It's expected to be in place by the end of 2025. Fourth, uh, Saudi Neom recently announced it intends to produce 650 tons per day of green hydrogen by 2026. Yep. Not surprisingly, Saudi Arabia, along with the UAA, UAE, is pushing the EU to make some long-term contractual commitments to purchase green hydrogen from the Gulf. And while the, uh, the EU, the European Council President, Charles Michel, says the con contract offers aren't yet sufficient, which makes sense. It's hard to price this right now. Uh, the EU, EU energy ministers will discuss the prospect, this prospect, when they meet on September 30th. Uh, finally, when MBS was in Greece the second time uh, in July, he was there in June and then again in July, uh, a Supreme Strategic Cooperation Council was launched along with the signing of 40 MOUs. At that time, Greek Prime Minister Mitsikakis stated that, quote, we have a historic opportunity to turn Greece into a hub for Europe for hydrogen. That is a game changer for both of us. With the telecommunication grid, we are going to change the position of Greece and Saudi Arabia, and we are going to support Europe, especially South and West Europe, with much cheaper and more efficient energy, unquote. So amid the torrent of news on Saudi Arabia every day, um, the point of this one big thing is don't sleep on Greece. Uh, this is a sort of a fascinating geostrategic play by Saudi Arabia that could accelerate numerous key aspects of Vision 2030, including digitization. Nailed it. I, I stumbled over that last time, big time. Digitization. Uh, yeah, digitization. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. You have to hit that T. Yeah, you do. You got you to lean into it. <laughs> <laughs> Telecommunications, data, data, clean and renewable energy, and efficiently access the huge and prosperous EU market. Richard, that was so good. This is why the 966 is so good. I mean, when you mentioned um, that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had visited um, a EU country twice this summer and it was Greece, I sort of thought the first thing that I thought about was the subsea cable because <laughs> when that was announced, it was sort of like, whoa, this is a huge investment. And, you know, you can actually kind of see the direct immediate benefit when this is finished. And then thinking about it um, as you were talking, the the history here, I mean, there's so much going on. None of these things are really top of the headline of any, really any day of news on Saudi Arabia. Um, at, but when you put it all together like this and, and you have the uh, visits by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman going twice um, this summer, 
And then you take into context some of the defense cooperation that they've had going on. Right. Um, Greece loaned Saudi Arabia a Patriot uh, missile defense system and sent 130 personnel as well to Saudi Arabia. This was back when the uh, war in Yemen was spilling over the borders a little bit and uh, Saudi Arabia really needed missile defense so that there was that. Um, and then it's just as soon as you mentioned it, the green hydrogen thing. Um, I mean, right now with the war in Ukraine and fall and soon winter looming for EU nations, and there's going to be a huge energy crunch there um, just to heat houses. And they're scrambling to try to combat that or figure out what to do without Russian oil. You sort of have Saudi Arabia saying, hey, I mean, it's, you know, it's tough to get long term contracts right now to, to agree to anything, but we've got a plan to get you off of you know, energy from Russia. And I mean, this, I mean, and this is green hydrogen. So we're sort of looking for you to give us some commitment because we're the one putting all the money down to actually build and develop this. We need a market for it. And, you know, then as soon, then you started, when you were talking about that, I went to go look at the map and you mentioned it, you know, Greece is really close to Saudi Arabia and Neon Bay. And that's probably where a lot of this energy will enter the European Union when it's ready. So it does all make sense. I mean, that's all I'm doing is just trying to, you know, uh, just do a little clap for that one big thing. Because it, when you put it all together like that, you know, uh, Greece and Saudi Arabia, you know, low key, a huge strategic alliance coming up in the coming year. I mean, this is huge. So I just it's really good. Um, very well, interesting. You make a good point, too, because uh, that that loaning of that Patriot battery along with personnel it came at a very anxious time for Saudi Arabia it was really good. Uh, really well received, but I think it's strategic too for Saudi Arabia. And I mentioned, you know, Greece's, you know, GDP uh, and and population. It's it's you know, it's not a it's not a powerhouse nation um, yet. Obviously, a member of the EU and integrated, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, networks and uh, economic pipelines and and telecommunications. That's what I think with a larger EU. It's smart for Saudi Arabia to go for something like this, not only because it's uh, you know geographically appropriate, but also you know Saudi Arabia is in a position, in a much stronger position vis-a-vis -vis Greece than it would be if you're if you're going to Germany and saying, hey, let's do this, because Germany Germany's obviously GDP and economy is is vastly larger than Saudi Arabia's. So they don't really they like Saudi investment. They don't need it. Greece, on the other hand, is. Like Mitsukakis said, the Prime Minister says, oh, we're still delighted about this. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Come, let's do this together. And so the reception is is different. And the leverage, I think, is different. Uh, so anyway, I think it's a curious, interesting, and and smart geostrategic play by Saudi. Yeah, and there was um, a little bit of friction in 2020, I think, maybe 2021, when Saudi Arabia's relationship with Turkey was not as good as it is today. They've had a big detente. So... Um, when there was Greek Saudi military cooperation, local press in Turkey was a little bit nervous about it, um, just because you know the sort of strategic position of Greece via Turkey. Um, but obviously, things have been smoothed over between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. They've worked it out, um, and so there's not that friction anymore. Um, Richard, a group of golf investors also um, bought a huge resort on the Greek island of Crete in 2014. I'm sorry, um, Corfu Island in 2014. Um, it's a, it was a golf fund, but they paid $550 million for that island and the resort. And that was right after the Greek financial crisis. Um, so they probably got a good deal on that. That's just like the last thing I wanted to mention <laughs> on that. Um, well, but who knows? But you, It'd be you, nice to visit that. <laughs> that's an, it's another salient point you make with Turkey because uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, is is as with the U.S., you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China, hedging all its bets. You know, it, it, uh, yes, there's renewed diplomatic activity with Turkey, and Recep Erdogan came, and and MBS visited Turkey as well. Uh, but again, uh, it's not it's not un uh, it's not un uh, it's weighed with maintaining good relationship with the Greek and Cyprus, which I, uh, Greece and Cyprus, which obviously do not have good relations with Turkey. Mm -hmm. And it's also in, in in light of, you know, Turkey is trying to assert some rights in Eastern Mediterranean in terms of energy and that sort of thing. So Saudi Arabia is playing its, its cards, I think, uh, intelligently, balancing this with that. And, uh, and, and again, seems to be thinking about the long term here. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a fascinating play, something we want to watch. 
Really good one, Richard. That is going to be a great segment on YouTube, which you can find. Obviously, the podcast goes out as one huge episode for the audio listeners, and that's sort of how listeners like to listen to it. But on YouTube, you can get each of these topics as segments, and we get a lot of new listeners that way because people are searching for something they may not be searching for us. And so um, I'm excited about that. That's a very good one. Richard, my one big thing this week. Um, Okay, so we've taken a little time off here. If you take your eyes off the Middle East region and Saudi Arabia in particular for one second, you will end up missing something. And though we've been off the air for two weeks, Richard, our newsletter never sleeps, which is why you should subscribe. You can do that at sustg.com. Just enter your email. It comes every day. There's six days a week, and it's just so good and so digestible. You can just scan it if you want. You can click to read more. Our click rate on that email is really high um, for an industry standard. People reading it closely, but... And, and Richard, you and I assemble it, so it's nice to sort of scan through after it's done because it's, you know, it's just kind of a nice digest. But um, a ton has happened, Richard, uh, in the previous few weeks uh, and months, really, in the airline industry in Saudi Arabia and the region. Just wanted to do a little bit of a rundown. You and I are both in the rundown mood here. Um, talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about it with you. Um, the big thing happening, I think, if you were to say the big thing happening for Saudi Arabia's airspace is they're launching a new airline, um, RIA, R-I-A. Uh, and we don't need to talk about it now, but that is basically being positioned to compete with Qatar and Emirates. They're looking for sort of a flagship carrier that does international travel, connects, um, you know, makes Riyadh or Jeddah a nice connection point if you're going east or west. We don't really know a lot about that. There's been a lot of reporting on it, $100, $100 billion, I believe, an in investment into it. But that, they're going to unveil all of that in a month or so, and we're going to tackle it then. So I'll just leave that there. It's not just the new airline, though. Major airport expansions as well in the kingdom. Of course, what, what was one ranked, once ranked excuse me, as one of the worst airports in the world in Jeddah now looks brand new and is completely different. Um, there are also airport new airports being built across the country and renovations in almost every airport in Saudi Arabia. So they're really committed to that. And they have plans to do the same thing with Riyadh as well, the capital city of Saudi Arabia. So investment in uh, new airline, investment in airports. Um, in the region, there was also a serious detente between the United uh, between United Airlines and Emirates. The two signed a historic commercial agreement this week that will enhance each airline's network. United, along with Delta and American, have spent years railing against the so-called ME3, Emirates, Etihad, and Qatar, um, maybe the ME4 soon with RIA, um, for being hugely subsidized by the government and creating sort of an unfair pricing situation. Um, and then Richard, the reason why I chose this this week is because Boeing released um, its 2022 commercial market outlook report where the manufacturer states that the Middle Eastern region's aircraft fleet is projected to more than double by 2041. And that's not that long. It's, you know, what, 15 years, 16 years. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a pretty short window to double the size of aircraft in just the region. You also have the World Cup coming to Qatar, um, which Richard will be flying tomorrow, actually, Qatar Airlines. Um, and so there's like a ton of activity going in, in and out of Qatar this you know coming fall. Um, and then Qatar Airlines was in the news this last week, um, really since our last episode. France-based Airbus, Airbus, in a rare order cancellation, confirmed last week that it had removed 19 Qatar Airways A350s from the backlog. Um, so there's just a ton of deals going on and a lot of moving and shaking in the space. But... Really, the takeaway here is that what's happening in the region is we're actually seeing traction on the region and, and Saudi Arabia in particular's effort to sort of follow through on their promise to be the gateway between East and West. I mean, you know, more than 20 years ago, if you wanted to fly to Singapore or China, you almost certainly did it through Europe. You would go through Frankfurt or Paris and then you'd connect and go over. Now, more and more, it's you're flying through Doha, you're flying through um, I mean, you could fly through Riyadh, you, you could fly through the UAE. So they're actually really following through on their push to do that. And all of this sort of adds up to one of the other major things they're doing with Vision 2030, which is driving tourism, driving to the hoop on tourism, I should say. <laughs> um, they really, really want inbound tourists. They are investing in domestic tourism. They also want people not just to fly through and connect the continents, but actually stay and visit Saudi Arabia. So I don't know if there is a takeaway here, but there's just so much going on. And I, I thought I might try to wrestle into one package. So just interesting. There's a lot going on. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see the new airline, um, Richard, yeah. which uh, looks pretty yeah. cool. But we'll, again, we'll save that talk for later. It will. I don't know. I, I, I've been saying just RIA, but maybe it is RIA. I don't know. Um, 
and maybe, and maybe gather, it will be all right. Yeah, I'm gather they're going to start more regional and local. I mean, I think that their first purchases will be 737s, 737 Maxes, which is awesome for Boeing. And you're right, this sector is just hard to keep track on. And, and Dubai really has the corner on transit as well as other things in terms of the region. It doesn't have the corner, but it's a it's a big leader. I just think. I think that's a, I love the topic. And I know I remember that, that Boeing commercial uh, sort of uh, update that they do. We, we, we actually did a segment previously on their 2021, maybe. Yep. Um, and I'm always, it's always very informative. Um, I'm always delighted. You know, we're homers. We want us corporates to do well. Uh, and actually Boeing, uh, is making it a little in terms of revenue. I mean, the, the Boeing revenue, I guess, uh, 12 months ending June was 60 billion, which is actually a little decline. Um, but to be honest, you know, this is, you know, their last normal year. So Boeing's last normal year was 2018. This was before COVID-19 and 737 MAX was grounded. And they booked, uh, delivered 806 jets. I mean, in 2021, they delivered 340. They're not going to get back to 806 jets, you know, before 2024 or 2025. But uh, but it's good to see them getting back to health. It's good to see them back into play and, and pass these very significant crises because, you know, it's a U.S. corporate and it's, and it's a, something we want to see, you know, succeed in the region. The thing, the thing that I like about this topic, Lucian, and I think it's an excellent topic, is that you use the term traction. And I, I think it's hard to uh, understand or see where something is headed right at the beginning. I, let me rephrase that. With so many things about Saudi Arabia, the surprise factor or the disbelief factor works against you understanding the bigger picture. So, for example, tourism. And, you know, when they come out and say, we want 100 million tourists by 2030, you know, the first response is, yeah, cut it out. You can't even drink. You've not even, you know, you couldn't even get in the country two years ago. This is, you know, when they first announced these things. You know, what, why do you even say these things? It's so unrealistic. And then as you get into it, so this is 2016, we're six years later, and you start seeing the traction. And with the traction, in my opinion, you start seeing the rationale. And you go, okay, tourism. Why? Why? You know, and then you realize, and this is according to World Travel and Tourism Council, that, you know, tourism, travel and tourism, direct, indirect, and, in, you know, other impacts accounted for one in four of all new new jobs created in the world. 10.3% of all jobs, 333 million and 10.3% of global GDP, equivalent to $9.6 trillion wow. uh, in 2019. And uh, and meanwhile, and, you know, associated with that, international visitor spending amounted to one point eight trillion dollars in twenty nineteen, six point eight percent of total exports. So you'd go, okay, that makes sense. And then when you say traction, it looks like they're actually having getting some traction. Uh, and then you go to aviation, and in twenty eighteen, aviation three point five trillion dollars in global GDP supported eighty seven point seven million jobs around the world. Um, and in 2018, the Middle East, in the Middle East, 3.4 million jobs with 213 billion US dollars in GDP and 4% of global passengers. All that to say, you put these together and you go, okay, you know, I, I'm past the, first, I, I get past the shock of going Saudi Arabia really wants tourists to come see their country. All right, shocking. Then you go, all right, so now they're putting in place not only some very attractive uh, places to visit, not only regulations and visa access that make it easy to get there, plus some really fascinating uh, uh, accommodations uh, with with development either in place and ongoing on the Red Sea, for example, and promised for other fascinating places like um, like uh, uh, Abha and 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 the south uh, southwest. Uh, obviously, Al Ula and Hijra are already in place. So I now I want to go to Saudi Arabia. I can get to Saudi Arabia, and all of a sudden it looks all oh, this all looks very possible. And and then when when it all starts to look possible, you go back to the beginning. It was 
It's going to create jobs. It's going to create a whole new e industrial ecosystem for for aviation and tourism. You know, uh, technical skills going to be created. Uh, a whole new generation of trained Saudis in, in terms of hospitality and and other things are going to going to result. Um, and I guess that's what I mean when you said traction. That all sort of clicked in for me. They're actually getting traction on this, and it's fascinating to watch. It is fascinating to watch. It's, I mean, I, I think that was just really well said. I mean, you know, when you were it's, when you were just saying that, I was thinking, you know, also, and you have mentioned it, but it's not when when it was announced. Hey, we're trying to get 100 million visitors. You know, your first thought goes to. Uh, wait, where to Riyadh or Jeddah? <laughs> where do you want these visitors to go? You know, and then you, you know, so flash, fast forward here, we have five years, six years in Vision 2030, almost seven years in. Um, Riyadh is a completely different city, completely different. Mm -hmm. Has entertainment, um, different seasons they, they have going on. I mean, live music, sports, a bunch of other stuff going on. I mean, things that would actually attract you to go to Riyadh. Same thing with Jeddah, other cities across Saudi. And then you have all of these new, sort of heritage sites that have been discovered and then not just discovered, but then sort of revealed as very important to human history. So there's that. And now you go from asking somebody random, you probably haven't been to Saudi, have you? To, have you been to Saudi yet? Cause there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's unlike any other place I've been. So, you know, check it out. And that's how a place becomes an attractive destination. And then you know, you think about it, they actually got this sort of micro level with it. They started hiring travel influencers, which got a lot of backlash. But, you know, if you search Al Ulla on Instagram, you've got all of these travel influencers with a million followers, more than that, you know, on a paid trip by the Saudi government going to Al Ulla and to, you know, the, the Red Sea and, you know, taking really glamorous photos and all this stuff. And, you know, all you have now is a whole new view of Saudi Arabia. This is this is quite the you know uh distillation from the discussion of aviation but it is all connected as you said and it's just this is the game plan you know getting the traction as we talked about i mean it's i guess i don't have any more to add it's just it's well, cool no, to see and, and we got eight more years until vision 2030 so and they seem they seem to be paying attention to the whole ecosystem they're not just spending money on on, on airports and Riyadh and, and your favorite Jeddah. Uh, and and, uh, and Damam, but also regional airports, you know, uh, are being spruced up or built across the country. The you know the the interface, the user interface, is so much better. You now you now are much more likely uh, to you know be met with a professional, uh, and very possibly a woman, uh, the moment you uh, come through customs. And and do your visa, and then you know, when, and the hospitality industry is staffing up, trying to train up, trying to get better, and it, and the government is supporting it every step of the way. So, but but again, I, I'm I'm just I just think it's notable that that uh, you know, way back when somebody said these are industries, tourism and aviation that are are not only lucrative, but they they do what we want, which is they bring skills, they teach skills, they create jobs. And we should go very hard at them. And this is how we should go at them. And, you know, six years on, six plus years on, um, you're seeing the fruits of that decision and the fruits of the commitment and the discipline to keep going at it. Yeah, I, I just want to conclude this segment, Richard. We, we've both had really great experiences with Saudi Airlines. It's not, um, you know, Saudia. It's not maybe a brand you would, you know, associate with being the very sexiest of the Middle East car car uh, carriers but they really run a very excellent airline. And, you know, we've taken the Dulles to Riyadh flight several times at least, and it's always just been on time, very professionally run. Just, I, we, I can't, I honestly, like, I have a beef against every single airline I've ever flown on, just, you know, because of volume at some point, United or you know, American has really, you know, made one of my trips through history, my history unpleasant, but I've never had that with Saudia. It's just very professional. And so, you know, Rio will compete a little bit with Saudia and Saudia's role might change a little bit, but they're sort of an unsung airline. And we've always appreciated the way we've been treated um, by Saudia. We've always walked off the flight saying, and that was great. Well, I mean, that's and, awesome. and just, just as a, as a, a point counterpoint, which I agree with you, Lucian, there, there's plenty of stuff and, and, but we're not, we're not, I don't think we're, we're typical travelers. We sort of anticipate and expect things to go wrong. Sure. And, you know, having travels from Saudi Arabia starting in the eighties, you know, when, when Pan Am was a thing, uh, 
I've been on a bad, you know, there's been a number of, of situations with Saudia that are not ideal. And they, they aren't disruptive to me because, again, you sort of, as a traveler, you know, you sort of anticipate problems. But there's, I've spent, you know, I spent 15 hours sleeping in the Riyadh airport because there was no, you know, because of multiple entry issues and, and you know, and connecting flights and this sort of thing, you know. So, so you know, I have a, there's a bench in the, in the old Riyadh airport with my name on it and my butt imprint on it. I think um, we have a future one big thing for you during no. a slow week. I want to get all of those stories out of you from no, traveling well, way back the, in the day. The point being is, is, is you know, it, it's just much better than it used to be. And they're striving for, you know, higher standards and, and best practices. Uh, and it's something that they're very motivated to do. It wasn't always the case and there wasn't always the incentives to do it. Uh, and and so Saudi has had its problems. I think it's getting better. And the RIA or wherever it's going to be, you know, it'll be another thing. Uh, it's all pretty exciting. Very exciting, Richard. What do you think? Let's yes. get to Yella. We've got yes. seven Yellas this week. Saudi in a minute, Yella. Oh, Saudi in a minute. I forgot. I forgot. I had that. Surgery. We we could have used this little break to get rid of that bit, and it's just back in full force. So, <laughs> and I, um, mis I mistakenly did it. I recently had surgery, and my you know my midsection is hurting. So laughing does not help, but it's all <laughs> worth it. It's well worth it. Number one, Yella Saudi in a minute. Saudi Arabia turns to AI for crowd management at holy sites. The artificial intelligence algorithms are to be developed and rolled out across Saudi Arabia to help crowd management and streamline services or pilgrims visiting holy sites in the kingdom. The second edition of the Global AI Summit in Riyadh uh, announced this, uh, and that AI technologies introduced recently at the two holy mosques have been helping keep crowds under control as they enter and leave thanks to faster decision-making while ensuring that no more than the right number of people are present anywhere around the sites at any given time. This AI Summit in Riyadh, Richard, was a really big deal. Wow. Um, there was a lot of... I mean, a lot of people that we know were talking about it, and it was just an impressive event. Um, AI, to me, is a solution, a really cool solution to, you know, and, and it's it's very futuristic and very powerful, but I think the number one problem with AI is being able to figure out the problem it's going to solve. And this seems like a really very good application for it. I mean, they're talking about using AI um, to facilitate the identification of pilgrims at certain points and then identify lost pilgrims, um, monitor traffic, transportation of pilgrims around the holy sites. Um, it's This seem, just seems like a really good application for AI and in an industry where AI is a great solution, which is we, we need problems to solve with it and, you know, and, and which aren't just removing somebody's job. Um, maybe this podcast could be an AI podcast in the next <laughs> couple of decades, but um, no, just this is really, really cool. And this is, you know, this is very forward looking for Saudi, um, you know, six, six million. Um, I'm sorry, it's two million pilgr pilgrims a year that they're getting. It's a lot of people to, to sort of manage. So very cool. But they're also doing it for the Umrah. And I liked, uh, you're right. It, it was AI week, artificial intelligence week with that, uh, with that summit. And, and there was a lot, a lot of announced. There were a lot of that now came in. I like that they're sort of moving beyond. Um, you know, the robots, you know, they're, they're robots that introduce a disinfect or interact with pilgrims, giving them directions, guidance, and water spritzes. But, you know, that they're moving into crowd management, transportation, and, and streamlining services. That's, you know, that's, it's very important, not only for the safety, but also uh, for the product. So they can continue to monetize and, and make it a, you know, significant part of their economy. So it's a, it's, it was interesting. Yella number two, Richard. Neom to house Saudi Arabia's largest studio with an industry-leading production incentive scheme. Neom, the highly anticipated futuristic region in the northwest of Saudi Arabia by the Red Sea that is currently being developed and ground has been broken, uh, Richard, actually for a while and has actually as well on the Red Sea development uh, project, which we discussed last time. Um, Neom has announced the opening of Neom Media Village and Bajda Desert Studios. Together, the structures will be the kingdom's largest sound stages with extensive production facilities. With the opening, Neom also formally stated that it would be offering an industry-leading 40% plus production incentive scheme for feature films, non-scripted and scripted TV, and commercials. There is also an opportunity for producers to garner a higher percentage of rebate based on their contribution to developing the industry in the region. 
you know, they, it's, it's interesting, and they, they're doing this with Alula as well. Um, I'm just impressed. They seem to go at it holistically, nuts, you know, soup to nuts, basically. They're, all right, here's, a, here's the sound stages, but here's also uh, housing and any number of supporting uh, key things, infrastructure, you know, uh, crew depth, uh, technicians, this and that, uh, construction warehouses, prop facilities, wardrobe, you know, a back lot. All, you know all these things that would uh, induce somebody, uh, obviously, with also with the with the um, financial incentives, um, to come and do something, and and they're thinking it through. They're they're making it very compelling for for anybody to come and just set up shop and 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 then saying we whatever you need, you don't have to offsite it. You don't have to bring in somebody to Europe or the U.S. unless you really insist on it. We have we have people. We're going to create, or we have people here. Richard, I see a 966 in-person episode in the future for us sometime in the next year. We'll use it, take advantage of these studios. We've actually never done one of these episodes in person just because it's so difficult to bring the visual media to it. I mean, but if you're, you know, look at us. I mean, if you're, you're trying to create content, you don't, you know, you don't want to have to go through buying a 4K camera and different angles and all the lighting and stuff. We can do it via Zoom, but to do it in person is still the industry standard. And so, I mean, I think this is going to just prove as an incubator or a sort of fertile ground for creators and, and media people in Saudi Arabia to actually be doing this there. So this is really cool. So we look forward to that. Maybe episode 120, we'll go up to these, we'll go up to these uh, Bajda Desert Studios and line up some interviews. I, I really like your reference to 4K cameras and stuff and all that, you know, audio and all that, uh, because we've done that, haven't we? Yeah, we have done that. I still have that really expensive 4K camera. Don't make me give it back. I'm just I'm using it to do time lapses at my house. So, um, but we could. Your, your kids, to, are, your kids yeah. are documented in 4K. <laughs> but we would have to to get that to make this an in person thing. The amount of just the amount of setup. I mean, regardless of the like tech and stuff, we'd actually need to employ. We'd have to. It would just be a huge hassle. So, yeah. I mean, this is really yeah. cool. I mean, this just creates removes that barrier to entry for people in Saudi Arabia. This just a good investment from the Saudi government, in my opinion. Well, again, extrapolating from personal experience, who, who, who do you know was the first person to be able to fly a, a drone in Saudi Arabia and, you know, for over government property and facilities? I think the YouTube viewers now know you're looking at them, the two yeah, guys. Exactly. That was a huge hassle to get Remember that the hoops permit. we had to go through oh for that? Gosh, yeah. And remember when the drone was almost not allowed in, even though we had the permit, we had to exactly. wait. We had to wait a long time. And I, exactly. I respect that because it was such new tech. People were like, what is this? Um, but yeah, that's us. That's our big yeah. claim to fame. So Definitely. yeah, what what a big leap. So um, yeah. Number three. Saudi Arabia bans the use of national flag and commercial promotions. Saudi Arabia has banned the use of the national flag and commercial promotions, including publications, local media reported. In a circular issued by the Ministry of Commerce on Saturday, individuals and businesses have been banned from using the flag in commercial promotions, including publications, goods and products, brochures and special gifts. The ministry said that the national flag contains the name of Allah and the official state emblem of the two swords and palm tree. The ban also covers pictures and names of Saudi leaders and officials. This is interesting. So this is they're doing this to make it just to make it very clear to consumers that there isn't, you know, direct government support of whatever is being sold. Um, but it also is interesting to me, Richard, because I feel like I see the flag and um, King Salman and MBS in almost every, you know, promotional document. And it's not like trying to take it, you know, take advantage of their likeness as much It's just, you know, displaying patriotism and so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in how this plays out. This was a bit of a shock for me, for me to read. I think you probably felt the same. Just as, it's really interesting. So, but, but I don't know. Like on social media, you just you can't use a Saudi flag to talk about, you know, the cars you're selling or whatever. I, I mean, it's interesting. I, uh, I put this in here just solely so I could go on a rant. Oh, okay. Well, we are ready. <laughs> <laughs> we are strapped in. Let's go. I love this. I hope it's draconian. I hope it, it, it. I hope it. They, you know, enforce it to the letter, across all, you know, all markets, all platforms, everything. Because one of the things I cannot stand is how commercialized the U.S. flag is. I, I, you know, my kids would just look at me and roll my eyes, 
when we'd see commercials when they were growing up and I go, this is not right. Um, even in the military, you know, and, you know, they use a the military for this. And I said, I just don't think this is appropriate, you know, a, a use of the American flag. And Lucian, did you know that there is a U.S. flag code that specifically states that the American flag should not be used for advertising purposes? I didn't know that. But yes. it doesn't seem to be enforced, if I well, may make an anecdotal passed, comment. <laughs> passed in 1942, quote, the flag should never be used for advertising purposes in any manner whatsoever. It should not be embroidered on such articles as cushions or handkerchiefs and the like, or printed or otherwise impressed on paper napkins or boxes or anything that is designed for temporary use and discard, unquote. Obviously, it was written in 1942. You know, uh, little did we know it was going to be on the back of Jeeps and on the, on the you know, butts of jeans and... And you know, on beer cans and everything else, you know, in an effort to 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 make money for some commercial enterprise, and it just infuriates me. I don't think it's the right use of the flag. I don't think people should, you know, if you want to use the flag, and if that it's going to be allowed, and you know, obviously it's you know allowed by omission because it's not supposed to be legal, but there's no enforcement. The the flag code has no enforcement uh, clauses. Um. Then you know you ought to pay a, a a royalty to the U.S. government or to some you know something to the U.S. people, some fund for the U.S. people. I just, it just it just infuriates me. Um, and anyway, so <laughs> so when I saw this, I said, "You go, Saudi Arabia. You know it's a national flag, deserves respect. Uh, people shouldn't be allowed to just take it and use it for their own advancement and their own monetary enrichment." Um, and so that's my that's my rant. I think that uh, that's interesting. I mean, I think that the like around 9-11 and I was pretty young, but I kind of remember around 9-11 is where I just saw the flag literally everywhere. And it seems like um, because it was just a ton of patriotism. I mean, uh, you know, George W. Bush's approval rating went to 90 percent right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. Everyone just like rallied around America and said, you know, we're all together on this. And so I think the use of the flag there really skyrocketed. I don't I don't have any data to support that. But um, but Richard, what you're suggesting you're suggesting is that I have a, a, a three wood cover, a, a club head cover. That's an American flag that I should be that I, at least whoever sold that to me should have paid a royalty to the U.S. government. So yeah, and that's and your your point is a good one. It's, it's two different things. What you know, there is a patriotism. There absolutely patriotism. Um, but I have no issue with it's the commercialization of it and with mm -hmm. of the military too, by the way. Mm -hmm. But by the way, the military when you know when you have overflight an NFL game and the military and this and that and this and that, the military gets some money. <clears throat> the NFL pays them a paltry, paltry sum to the U.S. military to to have these associations and these linkages. Um, but nonetheless, they do pay something to the military. Um, but again, these are these are these are important. You know, uh, the flag. You know, focus just on the flag. It is the symbol of our country. It shouldn't be commercialized. Shouldn't be used to, for people's personal monetary benefit. Uh, and it bothers me that it is. Flyovers are my single favorite thing about attending any sporting event cool. in person. They're so cool. They um, speaking cool. of flyovers, there is going to be quite the show across Saudi Arabia for the 92nd National Day. We wrote an article about it today um, for our website, suscg.com. They Eight. have a, yeah, they have a ton of things planned. So uh, 18, 18 flyovers in eight in different countries. Uh, just Amazing. extraordinary. Yeah, just really cool. So um, yeah, very, this is, this is an interesting story. I, you know, we'll, we'll see some stories leak out here soon you know, identifying people that didn't get the memo and, you know, would be in violation of this new rule. So, um, yeah, by the way, I, I, you know, we, 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 we might be remiss in not doing national day, a national day topic today. Maybe at the end, we'll throw in a couple, some of the things that are going on, but anyway, yeah, that it's a huge thing going on. They, and you know, we, we wrote about it today. We talked about it uh, actually before the show, but they've got, they've extended the celebration. It, it should be Friday the 23rd. They've extended it for nine days. So it's just a nine day extravaganza, um, which is really cool. Um, you know, they've got a lot to be pr proud about. Um, and this, they, they're billing it as the biggest Saudi national day ever. So yeah, should be cool. Um, and as, as we talked about, I mean, let's actually, while we're doing this, I, I, we should do it. Let's do a little extra one just to yeah, break so out. Yeah, so we'll do eight today. We Our listeners are in for a treat. Yeah, let's do, <laughs> um, let's make that, let's tag that on at number eight, which is two more than normal. Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll, um, 
we'll move we'll move forward here. Yellow number four, and then we'll add a discussion of National Day. I'm excited to talk about that um, at the end here. Number four, uh, Saudi FA launches Women's Premier League Division One. Oh man, Richard, this one has a lot of names in it, so this is going to be fun. The Saudi Football Association launched on Thursday the first edition of the Saudi Women's Premier League with the participation of eight teams, which I will read to you now in a very anglicized accent. The teams participating are Al Nasser, previously the Kingdom's women's team, Al Halal, Al Tahadi, Al Yamama, Nasser Jeddah, Shawalat Al Sharjia, Al Asefa, Asefa, Sama, with morass so that was completely indistinguishable and i'm very very sorry i'm sure uh one of our listeners abdul rahman is going to text me as soon as he hears that and you know just could be like what are you doing um the new season will start on october 13th on a home and away basis with a total of 56 matches the federation also approved the establishment of a division one with the participation of 17 teams which will be distributed across three regions that league will start on November 11th, also on a home and away basis. So very you know, cool. Lucian, one of the great things about you, and there are many great things, is your, is your actually wonderful demeanor and temperament. Because I realized <laughs> that, uh, that uh, when we did this one, for whatever reason, some of the translations were funky. And, and, and in that article, and so I, you had no chance because I think some of those were just misspelled. So that's not all on you. Oh, okay. So it wasn't but, my fault. Thank you. Thanks for no, saying that. No, I don't think it wasn't your fault. And I just, but I, I, but that's the beauty of it. You dove in anyway. And I think you should get a thousand points for that. Okay. Plus 1,000 points Plus for me. Lucian, um, yes. I did pretty well through the first four. And then, well, and that's I, actually out, yeah. some of the, some of the misspelling started right there. Okay, cool. So yeah, great. It was, so just it was not as well. A thousand Thank points you. for you for effort. <laughs> eight, for effort. Um, um Again, you know, uh, you know, the Saudis, you know, football is is meant to be not only a marquee thing, and it's obviously super popular, but it's trying to, you know, um, uh, improve and expand and uh, equality and participation. So the, uh, the Saudi Football Association has, has approved financial support for the Premier League clubs. They each will get uh, uh, two hundred fifty thousand reals. Each team in Division One will receive fifty thousand reals. So they're putting some money into it to help it succeed. Um, you know, the Saudi national team is trying to qualify uh, uh, for, for they're actually in preparation for a friendly match against Bhutan, and they're trying to get international classification with FIFA. So, you know, in terms of women football, women's football in Saudi Arabia, it's much more organized, much more high level, and, and hopefully become more high profile. Yeah, and this is cool, obviously, because it inspires young girls to play the sport. Um, you know, it creates sort of you know heroes for them and expands the viewership of of saudi women's football and just you know shows that it's cool to play football um yeah. and, and i for one i mean football so soccer is one of the sports where i i don't necessarily prefer women's soccer over men's soccer but i think they're almost exactly the same to me i i really like watching the women's world cup as much as i like watching the men's world cup so um, you know, this is, this is cool. I mean, this is progress. This, this would have been, you know, five years ago would have been, whoa. I mean, the, you know, women weren't even really allowed to, to play like this. So yeah, very cool. Very good story. By the way, I, I thought of you this weekend when I was convalescing, uh, at home, uh, when I sat down and watched Everton beat West Ham and, uh, and watched the whole stinking thing. You made it all, you went coast to coast. <laughs> I went coast to coast. I didn't intend to. <laughs> But, you know, the skill level is so extraordinary, uh, it, you know, and it, so anyway, I know you're a Premier League junkie. I am, as of this year, listeners will remember that I've committed as a fan to Chelsea. Um, so I, I haven't, it's on, <laughs> Richard, you'll love this, it's on my calendar. All the games are piped into my calendar. So I just get like reminders, you know, in 10 minutes, Chelsea is playing, you know, West Ham or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not going to watch that. But um, it's kind of good to know. So, I, you know, oh, do you see the game? It's like, you know, so anyway, <laughs> uh, maybe next year we can I'll get more into it. But um, yeah, I'm glad you made it through an entire soccer game. I have not done that since the World Cup. And even well, then, you, I was you just, got you know, two little kids. I mean, what's the chance? What are the chances of that? But oh, yeah, you know, no, zero chance. Yeah, right now yeah, we'll be doing that. We'll be doing some of that World Cup. Maybe we'll uh, 
uh, we'll do some more. I'm sure we'll do more on that. But yeah, I just thought you'd appreciate that. I I, I do appreciate that. That I'm impressed by that. And um, I bet I bet you make it through a game or two uh, in for the Cutter World Cup, Richard. I bet you watch. Um, I'm sure I will, and it probably won't be the U.S. men's team, which is you know it, you know. But the uh, I don't have a team. I'm definitely not that much into it. And it'll be interesting if I ever find one that's at you know that that reaches that level. Yeah. Um, but yep. you know, you know, you never know when you might catch a disease and it it sticks with you. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, this is what I've got right now. <laughs> what what day uh, of the weekend was this, Richard? Ah, uh, I think it had to be Saturday. So you chose that over college football, I guess, or maybe it was just played before college football. We're in a lot of good games on, yeah, uh, college football. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely it was Saturday because yeah, Sunday was a little bit of it was NFL. Is is uh, the U.S. are they in the Qatar World Cup? Does the men's team have a team? I actually think the U.S. might have a friendly with Saudi Arabia coming up. Ooh, okay. I maybe may be I'll mistaken. watch that. I could see the U.S. getting their frequently. butts kicked. <laughs> yeah. uh, they may be they may have a friendly coming up with saudi arabia but uh no i haven't i haven't seen the u.s team um number five uh global ai corridor more from that uh, global ai summit deal with saudi aramco aims to link riyadh to california saudi aramco announced the deal to launch a global ai corridor in partnership with beyond limits a U.S.-based artificial intelligence company, quote, the corridor is designed to develop and commercialize complex AI solutions, train Saudi talent, support Saudi startups, and together with a global partner to build a local AI ecosystem, unquote, Saudi Aramco CEO Amin Nasser said at the Global AI Summit in Riyadh. The deal, valued at $250 million, aims to link Riyadh to the U.S. state of California, Beyond Limits CEO AJ Abdelat said, told Al Arabiya TV on Tuesday, it will include building a center with Aramco that will focus on energy and combating climate change and will span five years. Yeah, this is a really cool story. I mean, this is also, this is a, a nice sort of tangible outcome from this AI summit, which I think we, we talked about it a little bit earlier was kind of surprisingly bigger of a deal than I thought it might be in advance of it. Um, but yeah, this is, this is really cool. Um, $250 million is, is a decent amount of money. Um, yeah, this is, this is very, very good. And it's, it's not surprising to see, to see Saudi Aramco right in the thick of it. Um, that center that they will be building, there will be cool. And I love the tie up. I actually think it, 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 it talked about a number of things, which are obviously very valuable, you know, aspects of it, you know, support Saudi startups, train Saudi talent, commercialize complex AI systems. I think a big part of this is funding. I mean, uh, venture capital and, you know, investment in AI uh, in both 2021 uh, and 2019 was over $22 billion and it dipped uh, to $15 billion in 2020 with the uh, pandemic. But there's a lot of money going into it, and there's a lot of money in California, and it's smart for Saudi Aramco to go there and be local. 100%. Um, Richard, number six. I actually have lost count. Is this six? That's it's got to be six. Yeah, yeah. six. Yeah. Number six, Oxford archaeolog archaeologists discover monumental evidence of prehistoric hunting across the Arabian desert, which is cool. Archaeologists at the University of Oxford School of Archaeology have used satellite imagery to identify and map over 350 monumental hunting structures known as kites across northern Saudi Arabia and southern Iraq, excuse me, most of, most of which had never been previously documented. This is another thing we were just talking about. The distribution of the star-shaped kites now provides the first direct evidence of contact through rather than around than a food desert. This underlines the important importance areas that are now desert had under more favorable climatic conditions in enabling the movement of humans and wildlife. It is thought the kites were built during a wetter, greener climactic period known as the Holocene humid period between around 9,000 and 4,000 BCE. Whoa, that is a long time ago. It is. And you look at the map, they've had kites before. The kites were just hunting methods, well, significant you know, constructs that helped hunters, you know, uh, basically herd and uh, channel game uh into either to be captured or killed or managed in some way uh and and the reason the reason i like this is we've talked about roads of arabia many many years ago to you know i think early aughts 
it was it was a you know a traveling show about some of the some of the archaeological uh, interesting archaeological artifacts around Saudi Arabia. It was the first time they sort of looked at pre-Islamic, and it, it was you know it was mostly a one and done at the time. But it, you know this this openness now, you know since Vision twenty thirty, they're looking at pre-Islamic history has uh, you know sort of unleashed and opened up such an extraordinary such extraordinary riches in terms of archaeological sites and history and and things like this and uh so i love it when new information comes out uh because it just adds to the the saudi story story it makes it more interesting as a tourism destination makes it more fully rounded as a as a place mm -hmm. and as a as a you know as a, a culture and uh you know peoples that have lived in in, in an area over time I, I just like the I really like these these articles and these reports and these fi these discoveries. It's cool. I mean, it's just going to be another thing to to see. You know, when you're when you're visiting, it's it's you know the the Holocene humid period between nine thousand and four thousand BCE. Yeah. That's that's just wild. Yeah, um, it that's really cool. Um, all right, so Richard, bonus, 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 time. Um, bonus, extra, bonus, yellow, extra innings. We've got two of them. Um, having added one here at the last minute, cool. number seven, Saudi Arabia's six hundred twenty billion dollar wealth fund plans to add a New York trading team for its U.S. subsidiary, according to a report in Bloomberg. The U.S. subsidiary of Saudi Arabia's six hundred twenty billion dollar public investment fund plans to hire a team of about fifty staff for its New York office as it expands its investments in the United States. USSA International, a wholly owned unit of the Public Investment Fund, will recruit for roles including investment research, legal and compliance, as well as chief of staff, according to people with knowledge of the matter who told Bloomberg. It will also build a team for equity trading at a later stage, the people said, asking not to be identified as the information is private. Yeah, interesting. I think, uh, I guess uh, PIF has been uh, opening offices all over the world, New York, London, Hong Kong. I'm not sure why they're opening in Hong Kong, but uh, they also applied for a, to be a qualified foreign institutional investor in China. Um, you know, they manage $40 billion uh, in terms of U.S. equities um, and invested more than $7 billion just this last few quarters. Uh, so it, it, it makes a lot of sense. It is interesting that this is, I think this is sort of, an, at least initially, administrative staff and legal and administrative staff because decisions, investments, decisions will still be made from Riyadh. And I suppose that's the case, you know, for the time being in London and Hong Kong as well uh, until these things can be built out. But I also, you know, decisions will be made from the home office. But it is nice to see them, you know, investing, building out a physical presence and, uh, you know, stronger teams in, in the U.S. Definitely. Um, they are creating jobs in the United States, a little bit of a reverse. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, very interesting. And then Richard, number eight, y'all number, number eight. eight. Look Let at me us. Take a run. I can take a run at this because this is, I've got an, a Saudi Gazette article here, and I'm just going to run through the headlines because cool. this is National Day. So the headline is Saudi, number eight, yellow number eight. Boy, this is bonus, bonus. This is yellow plus plus this episode. Uh, <laughs> so, Saudi Arabia witnessing largest ever National Day celebrations in its history. All right. So let me just run through the highlights. Um, they'll, they're, they'll be... Uh, air shows, as I mentioned, over the course of 10 days, the Raleigh, Royal Saudi Air Force is performing air shows in 14 cities. And obviously, the, uh, the largest one will be in Riyadh. So in 14 cities across the country, that's your 10-day window you mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's a bespoke Cirque du Soleil show uh, they've been working on for seven months. Um, there's a national operetta in Medina. Uh, and festivals are going to be held not only just in Riyadh and Jeddah, but 13 regions uh, celebrating his, uh, kingdom's history and authentic national heritage. 12 entertainment festival, festivals, uh, again, all over the country. Fireworks to light up the skies in 18 cities. Um, and and I guess that's just sort of the 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 top storylines of of what's going to be an extraordinary sort of celebration. And we've talked about it in the past. I'm fascinated by the National Day, but I'm, I'm especially fascinated by the Founders Day, which I think will be in February. 
which is new. This is the 92nd National Day. We've had a discussion about the, the National Day and how it, it didn't used to be celebrated. Uh, I think it was first sort of celebrated, you know, acknowledged by King Abdullah in, uh, in 2011. But now it's become obviously a national, a nas truly, a truly a national holiday celebrated by all in a grand manner. The photos from this event from previous years, um, and this, like you said, this is going to be the biggest one ever, but the photos from previous years are really, really cool. I mean, it's the type of air show you would see, yeah. you know, at a major air show here in the U.S. Just, you know, Typhoon, F-15, Tornadoes, F-15C aircraft. I mean, you're going to get a bunch of cool flyover stuff. You'll also get a bunch of really cool parades in the streets, which will be sort of like an outdoor party. You can only imagine traffic might be snarled a little bit from these events, which is fine. It's a holiday. It, this is just, I mean... And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to include some images and video for those watching um, uh, on YouTube, either from this year or last year, depending on when it hits, it may still be going on. Probably, I mean, it definitely will still be going on. So, um, but just, it, it's really, really cool. And it's it's a good, you know, it's like their July 4th. And so when people have asked me about it, I'm like, well, it's like July 4th. It's just, you know, patriotism all the way. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, this will run until the September 26th. You know, they extended it by nine days. It's, uh, that's cool. The Cirque du Soleil show, which is Richard at Princess Nora University uh, Auditorium, looks cool. I mean, that, wouldn't that be fun? to see that? That would be sweet. So it, It's not an exact comparison, uh, but it reminds me of the Indian Holy Festival. Uh, uh, you know, the, without the, you know, religious backdrop and that sort of thing. But just people in the streets just having a blast. Mm -hmm. you know celebrating and and uh everyone together it's just a, a, a you know it, it, the epitome of a celebration and so much color uh people with different get-ups and 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 it's just it's just really i you'll be there i'm sorry i won't be there i will be there um i hope to be able to get from the airport to my hotel <laughs> yeah, without exactly. any uh, snarl so that that may be a, a long part of the journey uh, yeah. I was not expecting to be there for this. I was expecting to arrive the day after it, but I guess it's just going to keep going. Bonus. Um, and bonus. But um, Richard, we used a photo today on our sort of roundup of the National Day, and we'll have more coverage on Sustig going into the weekend as well. Um, and, and I actually don't even know if this is, for, I think it is from a National Day celebration, but not in Riyadh. And it's just, you, you got it all in this photo. I've just been looking at it. It's, it's the traditional dress, It's but it's fireworks and just everyone having a good time. So, um, you know, just really cool. Probably in the future could be a really cool tourist thing yeah. to see because it just yeah. would be a huge thing, kind of like the Holy Festival So um, in India. So, yeah, this is good. Congrats to them. Very exciting. And, um, yeah, I mean, the flyovers. Hopefully I get to see one or two. Hopefully they extend a little longer. Well, I definitely will not be going to the Cirque du Soleil show. It's but, good um, to know you're a fan of flyovers. That's a, that's a, that's huge a I fan. agree with you. They're pretty impressive. Huge fan. Richard, 60, episode 60. Great 60. job. This was awesome. My brook. A lot of fun. My brook to you, sir. So we will be back a week from now. We will not have an episode next week. Um, at, at least we're not planning to have one next week. Um, but we will be doing one the week after that, and then we'll be back to our normal weekly schedule. We'll yeah. have interviews um, coming every week after this one. So stay tuned. We didn't fall off the radar. Uh, it's just there's so much going on in September. So we will be back in a week from now. I guess, sorry, a week from a week from now. Um, and then <laughs> we'll be back in full force. So you can set your watch to the 966 again. Um, Richard, thank you very much. Good stuff. Thank you, Lucian. Awesome stuff. Well done.